to the National STEM Championship 2023. We are already in the semi-finals, believe it or not. 16 teams are battling it out for a spot in the grand finals. Today, we're taking a look at eight teams from semi-final one and two. But here's the kicker. Only one team from each semi-final will move on to the grand finals. Which two teams will that be? Stick around to find out. Before anything else, let's take a look at the four teams competing in semi-final one. Raffles Institution Global Indian International School, East Coast Campus Nanyang Girls High School and School of Science and Technology, Singapore These four teams will be given a rare glimpse into the inner workings of an operational fire station and they'll even get hands-on with some specialised equipment I'm AC Liao Chiu Hong, uh, Director of the Future Tech and Transformation Department in uh, HQ SDF. Welcome to uh, Pongo Fire Station. Here we test back all the technologies. The traditional way of fighting fires for SCDF has evolved greatly since the introduction of robotic technology in 2014. Today, SCDF has an arsenal of robots serving various functions. Robots like the Unmanned Firefighting Machine, or UFM, greatly reduces risks to frontline responders as it is remotely controlled by just one person from a distance. The Pumper Firefighting Machine, or PFM, is a smaller version of the UFM and is deployed in tight quarters. Rover X, a four-legged robot, is packed with sensors and cameras and can move autonomously. It is deployed in dangerous situations such as hazardous material monitoring where the risk to humans is too great. SCDF also responds to urban search and rescue incidents. In short, USA, right? So USA incidents uh, can involve things like collapse structures. And collapse structures can be a result of uh, natural disasters such as earthquakes or even man-made kind of disasters. For urban search and rescue or USAR missions, the SCDF leverages robotic technology to reduce risk to responders and to enhance operations. Before sending responders into unknown and unsafe territories, a life detection robot scouts for signs of human life. After all that build-up, I'm pretty sure that everyone, including our teams, will have an inkling of what the challenge is. But just to be sure that we're on the same page, let's take a look. Your challenge, right, you will have three objectives. Number one, you're going to design and build a robot which may require some programming to help us map out what's inside these tunnels. Number two, you will be required to automate some portion of your robot in terms of the navigation. And number three, during the demonstration later, you will be required to present your findings so that you can make some recommendations to SCDF on how we can best deploy our resources in this disaster site. The mission was really to go into the tunnels to make sense of uh, the area of operations as well as uh, locate any casualties or any hazards that are within the tunnels. So the STEM element comes in when we bring the robots in. So we ask the teams to assemble a robot and also program it to be able to navigate within the tunnels to fulfil that sense-making mission. Teams only have one and a half hours to complete this challenge. What we did was basically, we tried to think about how many ways there are to assemble it so that it can best fit the criteria. We decided to just go with how it was supposed to be assembled. And we tried to discover new solutions about how we can improvise the design uh, into many scenarios. We just need to simulate uh, In this challenge, we certainly faced a lot of problems and difficulties along the way, such as in the assembly of the model and in the implementation of the code. We found out like there was a problem with our vehicle because when it was supposed to go to the left, it actually went to the right. And we had no idea what was causing this. Like we tried to do a lot of stuff, like restart the application. And then we found out that it was actually quite a simple mistake. It was that we built the wheels wrongly. So basically we just took out the wheels and then we put them back in in the correct order. And then after that, the problem was solved. The challenge was interesting because we got to explore a lot of different things, learn how firefighters in Singapore and the SCDF coordinate together to help uh, victims of a disaster. And we got to learn a lot of programming and coding and we were asked to innovate, which was uh, very interesting for us and we had to think out of the box. When we stop and we want to map something ahead, it's not going to stop because it's always, it's on always. 
When we turned off the lights, it was to simulate the low light environment that we were expecting in the tunnels. So it's important to us that the robot can see well, not just in light, but the camera functionality works well in the dark or in low light also. The this semi-finals was quite tough for us. We don't have much experience in coding or robotics, so it was definitely very difficult for us to find the right code. Okay, it stopped. It stopped? Did it stop? And I think that the time was also very tight for us because we didn't have much time to really test the robot out. I feel that the challenge really encapsulates everything about STEM. Uh, from the troubleshooting to defining the challenge and learning and figuring out solutions for that challenge. So I think that we have got to practice all of our skills from defining the problem, brainstorming solutions, troubleshooting, which is really important. We don't get many troubleshooting experiences outside of that. So troubleshooting here definitely gave us valuable experience. Now it's time for teams to carry out their USAR missions in SEDF simulated tunnels. They only have 10 minutes to show us what their robot is capable of. Judges will be taking a look at how much area their robots can cover, whether or not their robots can identify hazards, and how automated their processes are. Now this is of course no easy task, but first up we have Raffles Institution. Hey, turn, it's gonna hit the camera. Let it hit, let it hit. For the programming, right, basically we designed it so that the robot would toggle between two states, one automatic state and one manual state. And these two states, they actually work together to help us explore the course. This is a person, this is a casualty. Wow. At, the end of, at the end of here. So they did very well and they actually kind of cleverly programmed their robot to have a simple strategy which is go straight, you hit something, then you stop. So this allowed them to cover very large stretches. So that worked very well for them. Good game, boys. We'll make it. Let's go. Okay, let's go right, let's All right. So now so this is we, the should, we need, don't need to go here because it's dead end. So we need to go this way. Our robot, we believe, succeeded in mapping most of the area out. Uh, this was because we worked together as a team, divided tasks very efficiently. Okay, you can see a lot of cones. Mm, yeah, it's a uh, oh, that's a big cone. How do you get around that? There's a casualty at the end here. Yeah. Come on, guys, we have, we have map basically go, go, nothing. Go, 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 go. We were quite impressed with the GIS team. They did quite a thorough search of the, the tunnels, and they did, in fact, uncover quite a few of the casualties and the hazards within the tunnels. There is a wooden plank in here. I, can't, I actually can't see I can't, anything on the screen. I also cannot see anything. Where are we approximately? We are here. Yeah. Unfortunately, when we tried out the code during the demonstration, it was unable to carry out the command. We had no idea why, but due to time constraint, we didn't have time to resolve the problem, so we just had to do everything manually without the code, which was very difficult. What is going on? I'm assuming we just go under, under these things. Are we, are we trying to go through? I've been stuck at this place for hours because Left is right and right is left. I don't think we, we can get through. Then. If we are not able to get through, then this is it. Uh, they were very introspective in thinking about where they could improve things. Unfortunately, they ended up underplaying the most important part, I think, of the mission, which is to identify the dangers in the terrain. Moving forward. Forward. At, at line, I'm not going to initiate auto on yet. Uh, just going to continue can't. on. Left 50. There's... Okay, looks like a structure that collapsed. Looks like a hazard. Uh, lines, tank, wires. wires, yeah. They demonstrated excellent, uh, you know, teamwork. We could see that um, they had very clearly divided tasks. Initiating autonomy three, two, one, go. Tracking blue line. Left 45. Left 45. Uh, our line tracing code was very surprisingly accurate. They demonstrated a very deliberate manner of coding their robot to en enable it to have some form of autonomous navigation within the tunnels. 
It was not easy using Python programming, but almost all four robots managed to navigate around the obstacles in SCDF simulated tunnels. But that's not all. They still have a three-minute presentation ahead of them. Will they pull through? Stick around to find out. Welcome back to the National STEM Championship 2023. Now, our four teams from the first semi-final are currently at Pongo Fire Station, having completed their Urban Search and Rescue Robotics Challenge. Now it's time for them to present their findings, propose ideas for difficulties encountered in the tunnels, and showcase their teamwork. Now, only one team from each semi-final can move on to the grand final, so no pressure. So, our robot design consists of two states, the automatic state and the manual state. We were confident in their presentation as well. They kind of knew they charted out everything, and so they were able to present more confidently. So, some of the success markers is that we have discovered the important clues, the, and life inside the tunnel. Also, we have found the bottle and we have found the casualties. Sorry, that tunnel was actually obstructed by a large number of cones. There were phone cones in a zigzag manner, and it would be very hard for a human to navigate. So. What we would suggest based on the findings of the robot is that first all the cones are cleared out before a human is sent inside to rescue the casualty. Has this, it has a light. Say hello. <laughs> and there's, they're supposed to show us the obstacles in the, in the darker tunnel. It was quite a refreshing experience, honestly, when we received the laptop and then we logged into the coding platform. And we saw that there were actually a lot of interesting and new functions such as infrared sensing. So the first tip that we have for SCDF is don't use water as a main mode to extinguish the fires because there are yellow cables that could be could signify that it's an electrical fire. I think that this presentation will help us get into the grand finals because in my opinion our demonstration was pretty strong. Today was not an easy challenge in that it was the first time that the teams uh, saw the robot. They had to assemble the robot in a very limited time. They had to fulfill a mission which they were not too familiar with. All the teams did very well. All four teams in semi-final one deserve a big round of applause. Unfortunately, only one team can move on. And we want to say a big congratulations to... Raffles Institution. It was such a close fight. Now this means a second team is going to be joining Raffles Institution in the grand final. Which team will that be? It's got to be one of these four from semi-final two. Raffles Girl School. River Valley High School. Catholic High School. And St. Joseph's Institution. Taking an unprecedented trip, our four teams vying for that coveted spot in the grand final will be travelling to Jurong Island for their challenge. A warm welcome to ISE Square, our Institute of Sustainability for Chemicals, Energy and Environment. CO2 is our major challenge. One of the most important goals of sustainability is to achieve net zero carbon. ISCE Squared contributes to realising this goal for Singapore by developing CO2 capture and conversion technologies. STEM is actually being used in Singapore at multiple levels. So we are using the most state-of-the-art tech to solve our sustainability problem. To reduce as much CO2 as we can, as much emissions as we can. Some processes that return CO2 back to useful products use catalysts to promote the conversion of CO2 gas. We are going to show you how catalysts are being made in IC Square. This is the High Throughput Catalysis Laboratory, so welcome to our laboratory. In this laboratory, we make this catalyst to use in the different reactions, such as converting carbon dioxide to useful chemicals and fuels. Right in front of you here is a workstation which we customize to enable high throughput synthesis of catalysts. What the robot does is can do solid dispensing such as weighing. It can weigh milligrams up to gram scale level. It can also do liquid dispensing. So it can actually pick up the micro pipette tip here and it can draw solutions and prepare solutions to the concentration that you desire. During the tour, they, we actually found out that they use AI and all those like, automated machines to help them carry out manual tasks like pouring the test tubes and measuring the pH. Because AI was becoming like, more prevalent, maybe we could adopt it in real life and help us improve our efficiency when doing our everyday tasks.
We thought that it was very insightful seeing what we learned in school was being applied here and also nice to know how the government was actually putting in effort to make our production more sustainable. Our teams in semi-final two have learned that it is critical to remove impurities or they may prevent the capture and conversion of CO2. Will this knowledge be useful in their next challenge? Your challenge for today is pack purification column. We will clean up the kitchen exhaust until only the common components of air are retained. The challenge is about getting CO2 into a more pure state from a common household to like cooking. And they have to think about, okay, what is the science behind these things that are coming out in the fumes? And then how would they implement something to remove those impurities so that the CO2 comes out just as it would in air so that they can maybe then go do something else with it later. Teams only have one hour to complete their challenge. I think there was definitely quite a fair bit of pressure given that we're currently in the semi-finals and this is like the final hurdle before the grand finals. Currently, kitchen filter chambers do not really have some of the materials that we use in our columns, such as the activated char carbon, which is very effective in like removing certain pollutants. And so maybe we can find innovative ways to upgrade those kitchen channels that filter the kitchen exhaust gases. Okay, in the presentation, right, yeah. we don't, we cannot just talk about what it actually does. Yeah. We need to talk about considerations that you have to make. Yeah. So, example, uh, airflow. Airflow, or the order of the stuff. Order of the stuff. Order order of the stuff. stuff. Yeah. Okay, so definitely first thing that goes out is moisture first. Because yeah. moisture affects everything. The challenge is really about purifying gases so that it retains the normal components of air. And the thing is, we've actually learned purification before. Just that this context is really different and really unique. So the fact that we have access to many materials to carry out the experiment, and we have access to the internet to find out new concepts, it applies our current existing concepts that we know in, in a more interesting context. Clean carbon, carbon, just clean carbon, I think. Some of the factors that we had to consider for today's challenge would be firstly, what are the some particles inside kitchen air that we had to remove? And secondly, how do we remove those particles? So I think something we did differently from the other teams is that we crushed up uh, activated carbon to make granulated activated carbon so that we can increase the surface area to volume ratio of the activated carbon to increase its effectiveness in cleaning out the air. Yeah. So you have to cut your mask at the bottom first, then you have all these other stuff. It should be at the bottom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think the hardest part of the challenge was the time. Because while one hour might seem like a lot of time, there's actually we had to research what kind of pollutants and compounds that were impurities that resulted from the kitchen stove and all that. And then we also had to find out the explanations and the mechanics behind how everything works. So what we did was that we actually split the workload among the four of us. We were also able to bounce off ideas pretty well as we have worked well with each other and we know what the other is thinking most of the time. Our teams are almost done with their challenge, but they've got one more mountain to climb. Their presentation. How will they fare? Join us after the break. Welcome back. Now the pressure is on. Teams only have three minutes to show their understanding of scientific concepts and explain why they chose the materials packed into their purification columns. And of course, it's also about teamwork. Now how do we remove oil vapour? Well, we use activated carbon. Activated carbon binds to the oil vapour and traps it inside, removing it from the air. We from RGS, they did a really good job uh, in their presentation. They were extremely coherent among the four team members, so they all contributed to the presentation and added to further the arguments and the claims they want to make. So the first thing is, there's a mask. So what, what do you think would happen to the mask if the fumes initially go to the mask? There's also a potential that since mask is like sort of has some fabric component to it. So it's also possible that it would absorb the oil before the oil absorbed by the activated carbon. And perhaps one thing we could do to improve that would be to put some of the activated carbon above the mask so that it can 
absorb some of the oil first before it gets to the mask so it doesn't like clog up the entire pipe. They kind of figured out on the spot that they had made a mistake and they accepted the mistake and, and found the answer to uh, what they had to do and explained it to us. So the, the kind of integrity and courage that they had and thinking on the spot, that really stood out to me. We present to you our own air purifier. For well, the very first one, we have metal gauze. Afterwards, we have silica gel, then polyurethane, activated carbon, cat litter, a catalyst. I was very impressed by River Valley High School in the terms of like what uh, the components of that they should be absorbing that they identified and the materials that they chose. So although there were some concerning points that they mentioned a lot about, for example, enzymes and fungi, it's out of topic for what we are considering. I'm not very confident of our presentation, as I feel like the timing was a little bit too short for our liking. So there were a lot of important details that we were not able to fit into the timing. However, I'm still hopeful that what we added was enough to please the judges and get us into the next round. <laughs> I can't breathe. Oh no. The kitchen exhaust filter is not working. What will I do? Don't worry, guys. Me and Chen Yu have created a new kitchen exhaust filter. So at the bottom, we have cat litter, which originally was silica gel, but we decided to change it because we realised that cat litter absorbing water vapour at higher temperatures and also can last longer. And then we have catalyst. So I feel like our presentation today was rather okay, except for the fact that uh, we did have some hiccups towards the end, mostly during the Q&A session. The judges were asking us questions that we didn't really expect. I think the Catholic High, they had a um, very good understanding of the mechanism that goes on in the purification process and what each material does to remove the impurities and unwanted components in the exhaust. So I think something that we did differently from the other teams was to use granulated activated carbon, which means we crush the activated carbon so that it can increase the surface area to volume ratio of the activated carbon so that it's more effective in doing its job. Yo, look, it's Werner and he's cooking. Oh no, he's suddenly choking on the fumes from all the food that he's been cooking. So how can we prevent this? We can use a column that we have created like this, which is similar to a stove hood. The hot air will enter from the bottom and leave through the top. We are decently confident with how today's presentation had went because we managed to practice and rehearse this a few times over. And we managed to catch ourselves at a few key moments where we could have made mistakes and managed to adjust in advance and prepare thoroughly for it. The students surprised us actually, they found some other things as well. So what we're looking for in the column is actually a column that has a good flow of air through it that doesn't get clogged, which means that they have to use more granular particles, they can't use very fine particles. And importantly, getting the students to link again this idea about what is actually in the fumes and how it interacts with the materials in the column was a key part of the success in this challenge. The presentations for the teams in semi-final two are finally done and dusted. But who is moving on? Now, after much discussion, the judges have spoken. It's Raffles Girls' School. They will be joining Raffles Institution in the grand final. Now, the battle is not quite over yet. Two teams will be joining them in the grand final. Stick around to find out next week who they are. Meantime, I'm Sonia and I'll see you next time.